Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Maybe not who you expected. Um, my name is David, and uh, I serve as a lead pastor of a church in a suburb of Syracuse, uh, Trinity Assembly in Clay, New York. And it's my privilege this morning to uh, open up God's Word with you and teach. Um, my wife and I live in Liverpool, and we have three beautiful little girls, 11, 8, and 5, Lilia, Caroline, and Madeline. And so I end up watching lots of kids' movies, kids' films. And uh, last week we were watching Toy Story 4 together, which just came out on DVD. And so we ran out and we got it. And we, we were sitting together and we were watching it. If I'm being honest, they watched it. I took a nap. But, but we were together. Quality time, right? We were together. And uh, one of the things I love about DVDs are the special extra features. And so uh, we started to watch some of the features uh, on Toy Story 4's DVD. And one of the features, they, um, they talked to the different animators and those who were storyboard directors and all the different people involved with the project, and they asked them the same question. What was your favorite toy when you were growing up? And so they are all talking about different toys, and one of the people they interviewed, it might have been Tom Hanks, who does the voice of the character Woody in the movies, uh, he said, you know, the great thing about toys is that they'll do whatever you want them to do. You can play with them however you want, and isn't that true? You've never seen a toy talk back to a kid saying, I don't want to do that. I don't want to play with that other toy. I don't want, you know, give me my arm back. Like, toys don't say those sort of things. And then kids have the rude awakening of going to daycare and meeting other kids, and they realize that other people are not like toys. Toys do whatever you want them to do. Other people don't do whatever you want them to do. And you can control your toys, but you can't control your friends. Well, this morning we're jumping back into a series that you guys were in called More or Less, and you're taking a look at things in our lives that in some cases we wish we had more of, in some cases we wish we had less of, and this morning we're going to talk about the topic of control. I think if we're honest, we all probably wish we had more control. Control is simply the longing for things to go according to my plan, right? For every conversation, every relationship, every situation to go according to my plan. And if you're sitting there and you're honest right now, you're thinking, and? What's wrong with that? <laughs> that? That sounds pretty good to me. That's what makes this topic, I think, dangerous, is because the desire to have everything go according to our plans, it seems so reasonable, it seems so normal, it seems so human. Tim Keller said this, he said, the greatest nightmare of the approval addict is rejection. The greatest nightmare of the power addict is humiliation. The greatest nightmare of the comfort addict is suffering, but the greatest nightmare of the control addict is uncertainty. You know the saying, there's two things in life that are certain, death and taxes. If we could find a politician that would make those two things less certain, I think we would all know who to vote for next year. I would say in upstate New York, we know two other things that are certain. Number one, everyone's gonna forget how to drive when it snows the first time this year. And number two, the bills are going to find a way to break our hearts, right? So there, there, there are some things in life that are certain. But, but beyond that, there's really not a lot of certainty in life. And, and actually, what you've probably learned if you've, if you've lived any life at all is that the things that appear certain one day can all of a sudden be uncertain the next day. One diagnosis away from uncertainty. One phone call, one tragedy, one decision, either it was a decision of your making or a decision of someone else's making, it leads you from a place where you thought things were certain to all of a sudden they're uncertain. Uncertainty is the nightmare of the person who's addicted to control. And this morning, what we're going to do together in our time is we're going to look at an ancient story. It took place about 1,100 years before Jesus was born, so over 3,000 years ago. It's an ancient story, but I think it actually has a lot to say to our lives today. And just to give you some context as we look at this story and learn some helpful things about the topic of control, um, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 4. In the Old Testament, God is accomplishing his sovereign redemptive plan, and he's forming a people through whom he can give us Jesus. And uh, he chooses a man named Abraham, and Abraham becomes a family, and, and, and they become a people. And in Egyptian slavery, they, they really become a large people, and then eventually they become a nation. And in 1 Samuel chapter 4, they're sort of in the, the birth pains of becoming a nation here. Uh, they're coming out of the seasons where they had judges who would lead them. They don't have kings yet. And right now, their primary leader in the people of Israel is a man named Eli. Eli is a priest, and he's a, not just a spiritual leader, but in many ways he's a civil leader for the people of Israel. And uh, they're in a time where they're having to fight for their lives against enemies. They're fighting for land, and they're fighting for their lives, and one of their great enemies is the Philistines. 
And they have a battle against the Philistines in the beginning of 1 Samuel chapter 4, and they lose that battle. And in losing that battle, 4,000 of their friends are killed. And so let's look at what they did after this battle, beginning in verse 3 of 1 Samuel chapter 4. I'm reading to you from the ESV. It says this, When the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel, the, the leadership, they said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, who were actually wicked men, they were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And as soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that all the earth resounded. And the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, and they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, a, a God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for nothing like this has ever happened before. They thought like an actual deity had come into their camp. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And they fled, every man to his home. And there was a great, a very great slaughter. For 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Two things really that we learn in this story about control. And the first thing is simply this, that control is an illusion. Control is an illusion. And it's an illusion of our own making. So the Israelites thought that they could control the outcome of the battle by getting the Ark of the Covenant. They thought that they were in control, but control is an illusion. The Ark of the Covenant was a, a, a wooden box made out of a, a acacia wood. And God had instructed the Israelites to make this. And it really, in many ways, represented the presence of God dwelling amongst his people. It was, it was overlaid with gold, and on top of it were four gold rings, and there were two golden sticks that they would use to carry it. And there was a um, cherubim, a small angels on top, representing the mercy seat where God would come and sit and dwell with his people. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were the stone tablets, that, uh, the, ten, the commandments that God had given to Moses on Mount Sinai. This was the most sacred possession that the Israelites had. Because those Ten Commandments uh, reminded them of the most significant divine encounter, the defining encounter that they had with God, where God said, you will be my people and I will be your God. And so the leaders of Israel think, well, this makes sense. We're, we're losing these battles. What we need to do is go get the Ark of the Covenant, bring it with us, and then surely, because in the, in the history of these people, the Ark of the Covenant had been involved in some pretty miraculous things. So they thought, well, let's, let's do this again. And they thought that they would have control. And when you look actually in the original language, in, in the Hebrew, what they say is, let us take to us. And one of the things that the commentators say is that what's interesting is that they use a personal pronoun two times when they don't need it twice. Let us take to us. And what the commentators say is that this sort of like superfluous extra use of the pronoun, it indicates that actually the elders were thinking in such a way like, let's, let's manipulate this thing for our benefit. Let's wrongly take this sacred object for our personal purposes. And they were conceiving of the Ark of the Covenant as like a magical vehicle of power that they could manipulate for military ends. And the elders of Israel thought they had control of God, but all they had control over was a wooden box, because control is an illusion. Now, the truth is, in our lives, we don't really have control over very much, do we? I mean, we like to think that we do, but if we're honest, we don't really control a lot. And so what do we do? I think we do one of two things to give ourselves the illusion of control. We either, and this is in your notes, we either redefine things or we reduce them. I'll, give you any, I'll, I'll explain this in a minute, but let me just say it. We redefine things or we reduce things. Because we can't really control things, we have to redefine things and feel like we're in control of those things or we have to reduce them to get in control of them. Let me give you some examples. How do we redefine things so that we feel like we're in control? We experience pleasure and we call it joy. We chase after escape and we name it peace. We gather wealth and we define it as security. We think being feared means being respected or using force over people means having real power. So we redefine things 
so we can have control. Or we reduce things. Here's some example. we, examples. We reduce love to sexual experiences. We reduce real commitment to, to paper contract. We reduce meaning in life to accomplishments in life. We reduce real acceptance to artificial inner circles of our own making. We, we reduce deep approval to shallow popularity. And we reduce friends who know our lives to friends who click on our posts. And we feel like we're in control, but really it's an illusion of control. And in this story, it's the same thing, right? The Israelites, they redefined the Ark of the Covenant as a magical token, something that they were in control of, as opposed to something that represented the presence of a sovereign God who would not be controlled, but who was in control. They reduced the presence of God to a wooden box. And what they're doing in this story is they're using God, listen, they're using God to try to gain control over the circumstances of their lives. And I know we might feel like, well, what does that have to do with us? If you're, if you're, if you're a Christian, if you've been in church a long time, it probably has a lot to do with you. Because a lot of us use God to try to gain control. And there's actually a terrible history of this uh, in, in mankind of, of doing this. But what we do is basically we use our relationship with God in an attempt to control things in our lives. And when we do that, we see God not as beautiful, but we see him as useful. He's not an end in and of himself, but he's a means to an end. And so even our religious behavior is our attempt to control God. Even our spirituality, even our religiosity, even our serving, even our giving, the things that we do, our standing and our singing and our showing up on Sunday mornings, we show up because we think, well, I'm, this, will, this, this, this will give me more control over how God treats me and how my life goes. And in those moments, we're reducing God from beautiful to useful. Even when you do this, by the way, even your good works, even your best works, at best, it's an attempt for you to control your reputation. And at worst, it's an attempt for you to control your salvation. And we're trusting in ourselves. And I think this is in your notes, but you know, we look at irreligious people and we say, well, look at them. They're trying to control the world by breaking all the rules. But religious people try to control the world by keeping all the rules. And in keeping all the rules, we think we've indebted God to us. And now he owes, certain, owes us certain things. And this is what's happening here. They're using God to gain control. Now, beyond this story, we realize that you don't just use God to gain control. It's part of our nature to use anything and everything to gain control. We have to have control. And listen, if we can't control one area of our lives, then we double down in another area. Let me explain. 2017, my family went through a really difficult season. I lost my father uh, in February of that year to pancreatic cancer. Lost my younger brother in October of that year to a sudden heart attack. And if you walk through that sort of grief, one of the things that you, I didn't anticipate was how out of control I felt because I couldn't control the diagnosis my dad received. And I couldn't control the number of days that he had left to spend with us. And I couldn't control how much pain he felt. And I couldn't control how it made my mom feel. And I couldn't control any of that. I couldn't control this sudden heart attack that, for my brother. I, I, I couldn't control how that affected my mom. I, I just, I felt like everything in my life was out of control. And although I didn't realize I felt that way, it began to manifest itself in other ways. Because remember, when you lose control in one area of your life, you'll double down in other areas. So here's how it manifested for me in the way that I would interact at times with my daughters. We'd be driving somewhere, and they would be making what's a normative amount of noise in the backseat of a car for, a tenure, for, for little girls. And I would just kind of be like, all right, girls, hey, come on. Daddy's trying to drive, trying to focus. I got a lot of drivers to yell out and correct, so just keep it down back there. And, uh, and uh, they're not bad girls. They're great girls, but they would get louder, and they're, they're giggly, and they're laughing, the girls, and, and they're having a good time. And, and all of a sudden, I would just snap. And I'd just like get so angry and I would yell at them. I'd be like, knock it off. You know? and, then, and then I'd be done yelling and I could see my wife's kind of like looking at me like, what is your problem? And, uh, and I, I'm just thinking like, why did I do that? Like that's not the dad I want to be. That's not the type of person I, I think God's making me to be. Why did that come out of me like that? And through some reflection and help of friends and the Holy Spirit, I realized because I felt like I couldn't control my world, I needed to control my backseat. And I had to double down. And it brought out of me all sorts of, and so here's the vicious cycle of control. You learn that you can't control your past, so you gotta let it go, right? So let's just focus on our future. Oops, can't control our future. Okay, forget that. Let's just control today. It's tough. We think we're in control, but you're, remember, one phone call, one situation, one tragedy away from not being in control. So, okay, let's at least control my emotions. And so here's the thing. Our inability to control what's happening around us exposes our inability to control what's happening 
inside us. And now we're just, our only solution outside of where we're headed this morning, by the way, is to just double down and try harder to control ourselves. I can't control what's out there, so I'm going to control what's in here. And either way, you're still a slave to control. And the one thing that will destroy you is uncertainty, which is the one thing that life is guaranteed to offer you. And this is the danger here. Control is an illusion. It's not something we can actually fully have. Second thing we see in this text is that control is not only an illusion, control is an idol. Control is an idol. Control as an illusion, it appears to be something it isn't, but control as an idol, it's more dangerous. It appears to give you something it can't. You think if only I had control, then life would be good. But control can't actually give you that. What's an idol? An, an idol is simply anything that you treasure and trust in more than Jesus. An idol is anything that you love, that, that you value, that you pursue, that you think about, that you obsess about, that you daydream about, that you have to have, anything that you have to have, anything that controls you, that's, that's, that's an idol. And we all have idols in our lives. And one of the evidences of idols in our lives is when our normal, natural, okay desires become overwhelming, controlling over desires. And now we have to have those things. And what happens when your longing and my longing to have control ends up controlling me and controlling you? What, what happens when what you want most actually has you? I wrote down some things that happens. Uh, when, when you have to have control and when your need to have control controls you, here's some things that will happen in your life, some behaviors. Um, we lose our temper in traffic because we can't control all the idiots driving around us, right? And, and so it bothers us. We jump online and we vent about politics because we can't control what's happening in our country right now. We won't be radically generous because we have to control our wealth and our finances because it's, it's something we can control. We are measured in how we love each other. We're very measured in the time that we give to each other. We're stingy with our attention and with our resources because we gotta control it. We gotta keep it safe and close to us. We lose our joy in a season of suffering because if we can't control what's happening to people around us, then how can we move forward? We give up hope on a marriage because we feel like we can't control the other person. We lose our bearings when a child that we love and have poured into goes a path down a path that we would not have chosen for them. We question the goodness of God, his promises, his faithfulness, his sovereignty. And then ultimately, here's where it all leads, we lose the will to live. Because when you can't have your idol, you'd rather die in a world, you'd rather die than live in a world where you can't have what you love most. And control can be that thing. And this, by the way, is the nature of idols. You sacrifice yourself for them and you die to have them. Now, let's look at how the story ends. 30,000 Israelites die in this battle. 30,000 Israelites die. They run back to Eli, the leader the civil spiritual leader of Israel, and they report to him. We lost, 30,000 men died, your sons died, and by the way, the Philistines have the Ark of the Covenant. And it's so traumatizing for Eli that he falls over in his seat, he breaks his neck, and he dies. So on one day, Israel loses all its leadership, Eli and his sons. They are a leadership nation. And what happens now at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 4 is that Eli's daughter-in-law, who's the widow now of Phineas, goes into labor because she's also traumatized by what's happened. And in labor and giving birth, she dies. And before she dies, the last thing she does is she names her son Ichabod, which means the glory of God has departed from Israel or the glory of God has been exiled from Israel. And chapter four ends and you're like, Whoa. <laughs> that was a bad day. That was a pretty bad day. This is where we get. And by the way, this is where idolatry leads us, our desire to control. We end up losing things that we want the most. Now, are you ready for some good news? <laughs> it's not all bad news. Are you ready for some good news? In this story, it feels like they feel like God's not in control. But God is 100% in control. He's working. And what I want us to see as we finish is how God responds to their idolatrous desire for the illusion of control. What is he doing in this story, and what does he do in the next couple chapters? I want us to see this. Three things he does. Number one, he allows his reputation to take the hit. He allows his reputation to take the hit. Let, let me explain. In the ancient Near Eastern culture, all of these people groups, the Israelites, the Philistines, the Moabites, all those ites, every single one of them, there was no such thing as secular humanism back there, back then. Everybody believed in the divine. Everybody had gods. Most of them were polytheists. That's what made the Israelites unique in that they were monotheists. They believed in one God. But everybody believed that there was a spiritual explanation for everyone and for everything. And so whenever two 
people would go to battle, two nations would go to battle, the Israelites against the Philistines, what everybody believed is that the stronger God would win. Whoever was serving the stronger God, that's the nation that would win that battle. And that's the explanation that they all believed for victory and defeat in battle back then in the ancient Near Eastern world. And so when God allowed Israel to walk into defeat and lose to the Philistines, he actually was allowing his reputation to take a hit. He's the one that now they said, oh, see that God, that, that Yahweh God, he's not as powerful. I mean, we just beat them back to back when we're killing them. That God is a false God. He has no power. He, can't do, he allows his reputation to take the, take the hit. The second thing he does in this story is he allows himself to be placed in the hands of the enemy. The Philistines take him. They bring them into his temple. But the third thing that he does, and I love this, is that in spite of that or through that, through both of those, he allows his reputation to take the hit. He allows himself to be in the hands of his enemies. He accomplishes his greater purpose. We won't read it, but in 1 Samuel chapter 5, the Philistines bring the Ark of the Covenant into their temple, and they put it next to their god, Dagon. And they go to bed feeling pretty good about themselves. And they walk in the next morning, and Dagon is falling over right in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And they're like, this is kind of weird. <laughs> and uh, they're like, well, maybe the cleaning company bumped it and knocked it over. So, so they just kind of like, they prop it back up, and, and they go back to bed, and they walk in. And now this time he's fallen over, and his hands have been, the hands of this idol are now cut off, and his head is cut off. And they're like, uh-oh. <laughs> we've messed with the wrong God. And what we see God doing here is he, begin, he begins to reveal his power from a place of weakness. He begins to accomplish his victory on his terms, in his ways. And long story short, the Philistines are like, we don't want this thing anymore. We can't control it. They know they can't control it, even though the Israelites thought they could control it. We're just gonna send it back. And it goes back to Israel. And what happens in 1 Samuel chapter seven is that a young man rises up to fill the leadership void and his name is Samuel. And Samuel stands up and says to the nation of Israel, if you will turn away from your idols, idols like control, if you will turn back to God, he will lead you into victory over the Philistines. And in 1 Samuel chapter seven, the Israelites and the Philistines fight again. And this time Israel destroys and defeats the Philistines. And seven chapters after this, this man, Samuel, walks into the home of Jesse, who has eight sons, and he anoints the youngest, whose name is David, who we will know to be King David. And through the line of King David, someday will come King Jesus. Can you see that in this story, despite the fact that God has allowed his reputation to take the hit and allowed himself to be placed in the hands of his enemies, he's still accomplishing his greater purposes. That's how in control our God is. That's how powerful our God is. And as we sing this morning, even when we can't see what he's doing, he's working. Even when we can't feel what he's doing, he's working. So that's what he did for them. What does he do for us? What does he do for our idolatrous? What does Jesus do for our idolatrous desire for the illusion of control? And as it turns out, it's the exact same three things. Jesus allowed his reputation to take the hit. He became sin. He became, well, he became human first. He wrapped himself in flesh. He walked amongst us. He was accused of all sorts of things, glutton, drunkard, friend of sinners, and then accused of crimes he didn't commit, died the death of a criminal, and he allowed his reputation to take the hit instead of ours. Secondly, he allowed himself to be placed in the hands of his enemies. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay my life down. And this is what Jesus has done to settle our issue and our need of control. And then lastly, he accomplished his greater purposes through it. At the cross, Jesus provided us with the certainty of his work, the security of his love, and everything about the cross, if you see it, if the Spirit will help you to see the cross this morning, everything about the cross speaks to your fears, that you're not good enough, that you're not in control, your anxiety, your need to be in control. And here's what the cross does. It invites us to trust. If this God will do this for us, if he will take the hit for us, if he will allow himself to be placed in the hands of his enemies for us, will he not work out his good purposes in us, through us, and for us? We want more control. But here's the good news and the bad news. God isn't interested in giving you more control. God's interested in inviting you to trust that he's in control. When I was in college, I spent two months in New York City doing an internship. While I was there, I needed to get a haircut, and I walked into this barbershop in Queens, and nobody was speaking English in there, but they knew why I was there. And so uh, <clears throat> I sat down, and most barbershops, they, they ask you, what kind of haircut do you want? Not this place. <laughs> 
Most barbershops, they use one hand at a time. Not this place. This guy had scissors in both of his hands. <laughs> Ambidextrous. And most barbershops, they kind of stop at certain times throughout the haircut to let you take a look at what they're doing and to sort of regather themselves. Not this guy. He literally did not stop cutting my hair until he was done. And both of his hands were going at full speed the entire time. Edward Scissor hands is just like going to town on my head. And the whole time I'm sitting there and I'm praying a hedge of protection around my neck and my arteries and my throat. And I, I couldn't even watch. I, most of the time I had my eyes closed. I didn't even want to look. I was just like this, like, oh, God, save me. <laughs> and then he said, done. And I opened my eyes and looked in the mirror. And to this day, it's one of the best haircuts <laughs> I've ever had. And I realized just because I couldn't see what he was doing didn't mean he couldn't see what he was doing. Just because you and I can't always see or feel or know what God is doing doesn't mean for a second God doesn't see what he's doing. He knows. He sees. And he's so faithful that he's never for a moment in your life or in the lives of those that you love, he's so faithful he's never left the work of his hand. He's faithfully at work. And so we learn to trust. We learn to open up our hands and say, God, control is an illusion. It's not even real. Control is an idol. It'll destroy me. But you're real, and you're worthy, and I trust you. Let's bow our heads together. One of my favorite hymns says this. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Some of you this morning, resting upon his promise would do you so good. Some of you, your heart hasn't rested in years. Your mind can't rest at night. You don't even know what rest feels like. And he's inviting you this morning to rest, not upon your performance, but upon his promise not upon your ability to keep things under control, but his good work. And then the Course says this, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. You can either crave for control or you can receive grace to trust. This morning, Holy Spirit, give us the grace we need to trust you. Let's stand together this morning and respond in song.